<laughs> so you're having to get up to put the soother and back in on it. And eventually sometimes you have to bring her back into the bed so she goes to sleep. So you know you bring the baby back into your bed. And then after about an hour of lying in the most uncomfortable position possible with your left arm outstretched and it's now dead, you're like, all right, it's half hour, I'm going to put the baby back into the cot again. Is there anything more dangerous than bringing your child back into their own room at half four in the morning? Dangerous how? To wake them back up or to No, because you're so bloody half... <clears throat> literally last night stairs. I nearly went straight, literally just fell straight over. Yeah. I got out of bed, I'm half asleep. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, throw my wife under the bus. Two nights ago, she smacked the baby's head off the door. She was going out of the room. <laughs> oh, this podcast is really taking it. We've all, we've all done it. I'm, yeah, deaf. That's, I'm like... It's every single time I get out of bed and have the baby in my arms and this arm is dead and straight away my legs are wobbly and you're going, oh my God. It's only like 25 steps to bring her back to the cot, but literally it is. No, we've all closed the car door before our kids are fully, <laughs> fully exited have the we? car. Well, my fellow's been clipped up once or twice. <laughs> and he's, and now then, you're very welcome along to the Sunday Paper Review. We are joined in studio by David Snade, football journalist. We also have Hugh Farley with us, Deputy Head of Sport at the Mail on Sunday and the Irish Daily Mail, and obviously a man you'll know for his rugby coverage as well. I'll go through the back pages to kick things off. Liverpool, as you might imagine, are on lots of the back pages. Firm grip on the title, as has been the case for some time now. Best start ever to Premier League has Liverpool 16 points clear at top. The picture is of Robert Firmino after his uh, goal against Spurs. Yesterday evening, a 1-0 win for Liverpool. The star go with the same story, specialist in winning, but record-breaking Klopp not interested. This is Jurgen Klopp, who's not overly bothered by the record that they've set. And fill your boots, Guardiola, Foden, our next Silva. David Silva set to leave Man City at the end of the season. Guardiola saying he's not going to go into the market for a replacement because he has Phil Foden. Back page of the sun. Top left corner, we have a picture of Harry Kane on his hospital bed after his surgery. Bed rest, Kane on the mend, Harry Kane braced to start his recovery from yesterday's surgery on his ruptured left hamstring. And then beneath that, Red's best, Klopp's men break Euro points record. Sunday Mirror Sport, Guardiola, Foden our new Silva, again a similar theme. Phil Foden to take over from David Silva in Guardiola's eyes. And Van de Bleek, Ajax star off to Real Madrid for £46 million after Red's Chiefs pulled a plug on cut price £20 million deal. Manchester United says Simon Muller could have had Donny van de Beek for £20 million. He's now off to Real Madrid for £46 million. Then the uh, Sunday Independent, a few things here. Picture of Firmino again, Liverpool looking invincible as they edge closer to the title. And a picture of Desi Farrell on the bottom of the front page. Farrell's fledgings narrowly defeated in New Dawn, a one-point loss to Longford yesterday, although really it was depending on which piece you read, something approaching a D or E team for Dublin. Back page of the Mail on Sunday, 16 points, 38, or 16 points clear rather, 38 games unbeaten. Liverpool are record breakers is the back page. And then a story we'll come to in just a moment. Toner dismisses Schmidt's World Cup, quote, excuse. Devon Toner has been speaking to the Sunday papers today. And the uh, Sunday Times then, again, it's Robert Firmino, record breakers, 16 points clear at the top of the table, uh, 61. Euro points landmark for first 21 top flight games. Nobody in the top five leagues has hit 61 points for 21 top flight games. And it is now 374 days since their last Premier League defeat. And again, that Devon Toner story, Toner unimpressed by Schmidt, excuse on World Cup omission. So Devon Toner, Hugh, has spoken at last, really. It's the first time we've heard him speaking about his omission from the World Cup. And he's in all the papers, Shane McGrath there in the back page of the Mail. Brendan Fanning has it. I have Peter O'Reilly mm. here. They all uh, take a very similar theme, as you might imagine, and they go back to the moment Devon Toner found out he wouldn't be going to the World Cup. Peter O'Reilly writes, Devon Toner was watching TV with his wife when Joe Schmidt called. It was Sunday evening, September the 1st, the night before the World Cup announcement. The dreaded call, as it's uh, described <coughs> here, is what Toner received. I was just on the couch, he said, with Mary. His name came up. I showed it to her, and I was like, what's this? I went to the kitchen, I took the phone call, and that was it. I went back in, and she couldn't believe it either. It was more shock the first night. The next day, it started eating away at me. People would probably say I'm quite level-headed off the field as well. I'd probably take things in my stride. A bit too much, probably, people would say. But obviously, I was disappointed. Like, I was bitterly, bitterly disappointed. I suppose it was probably anger for a day or two as well, but I got over it. It sunk in, and I had to move on. 
uh, says that his, his wife or his partner Mary was a bit angrier than me. I was telling her to calm down. I didn't vent. I texted a couple of people. I let it fester for a few days. And ultimately, he says that he didn't put any stock really in Schmidt's version of events. Schmidt wrote about how one of the key reasons, if not the key reason, that Toner was admitted was a fear of an imminent sighting. Uh, Toner says this is an excuse, frankly. So he says, um, where's the exact quote? I was pretty confident in going, probably a bad thing as well. I should, have, I should have been kept on my toes a bit more maybe, but I thought I was going. I wasn't 100% confident. And he says, uh, the conversation that I had with Joe was I wasn't going because they needed a tight head lock and I didn't show enough in the preseason games. Coming to the tail end of the conversation, he mentioned something about a high hit, but like he never used it as an excuse that I wasn't going or why I wasn't getting picked. So when I saw that assertion, to me, that's maybe an excuse. When Joe mentioned it, I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't even remember a tackle. Mm. Farley's, Farley's getting angry here. Yeah, in I, I do get angry. Like th This was a massive shock, obviously, but and a colossal error by Schmidt, I think. I, to the point where I would say bringing Jean Klein instead of Devon Toner was the equivalent of England taking Sam Burgess to the last World Cup. Yeah. I think it was that kind of decision. It was the poster boy selection, wasn't it? Yeah, like yeah. He's, he's become a kind of a figurehead for everything <coughs> excuse me, that went wrong, Klein has. Um, now, like Brendan, Peter and Shane, all very experienced, all know their business, and they've all done a nice job on, on Devon Toner, but he says it himself that he's very level-headed and this for him, you know, he normally doesn't give a whole lot away. This for him is a very reason, but it's still for him is dynamite. Like what he's saying here, he's basically dismissing the reasons that Schmidt gave him or gave for his exclusion, specifically the um, the, the, fear uh, the, of the sighting, sighting thing, yeah. which I mean, as somebody made the point, uh, one of the lads made the point that, you know, why not pick him anyway? And if he is sighted, replace him. Do you know what I mean? There, there was no reason not to pick him. And the reasons given, even aside from the sighting reason, the, the tight head lock thing <coughs> does my head in. Do you know, Devon Toner was there for how many years under Schmidt um, and the scrum wasn't an issue. And all of a sudden, you know, this, this notion that you have to be a specialist to push behind a tight head. The scrum lives or dies by your tight head prop, the, the front row. Mm -hmm. Second rows, you know, don't get any credit if it goes well and they get blamed if it goes badly. But like, that's not enough a reason to bring a guy um, ahead of someone like Toner. Um, I think there's a kind of a tremendous goodwill towards Toner, and even reading these pieces, you can sense it coming across. He's a very likable guy. He's 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 like an ordinary guy who happens to be, you know, he, he's enormous. Like he's six foot eleven. Mm. He's had a lifetime of people saying what's the weather like up there, and you know he's quite reserved on the back of it. I remember interviewing him actually years ago. It was 2008, I think, because you, you try and get the young quiz on the way up, mm. and I'd seen him play for Lansdowne in the AL, and you could just see he was. But the way he's changed over the years in his style, when he started out, his height made him an easy target. He used to crumple in contact and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he worked so hard on his game to be more than a line-out guy. And Schmidt did a lot of that work. And then to just yank it away from him at the last minute, you know, it was, it was, um, it was brutal. Mm. Like, like he, he was done on a phone call. Yes, well, yeah, the night so, before. Like, so you would think for a manager who's worked with a player like that and who's like being on a, on a, on a newest desk as a sub better, like, Toner is always one of these players who's put up for interview because he's like so yeah. steady. Like, he's the amount of interviews with Devin Toner that have subbed is incredible. Like, he's always put up. I just can't believe that Schmidt didn't have the courtesy to actually do a face to face. Well, I guess maybe there's a lot going on and he's got lots of people to call. Like, the thing is, Schmidt's been accused of being too loyal to players. Yeah. Not according to Devin Toner. He was, he was the last person you'd see. Okay, he's forming the pre-World the, the pre Cup, you know, the Mickey Mouse game, so what, you know? Mm. This was a cornerstone. He was there for all the big days. The All Blacks wins, South Africa, oh, he was there for all of them, the Grand Slam. Like, and the other aspect to it, and I, I you know, this is a bugbear of mine, I don't want to go down there too much, but th who replaced him? A guy who qualified a couple of weeks beforehand, mm. you know, parachuted in. I mean, there's all kinds of strands to that. You know, we don't pick Simon Zebo or Donna Ryan because they're not there for the preparation. If you pick a guy who lands in, you know, a few weeks beforehand, there's a hypocrisy there. Mm. But that side of it is interesting because, you know, Tone is very popular. There's, you know, we saw against Japan and, and the All Blacks at the World Cup, was there a psychological issue, a morale issue. Mm. I wonder the impact of Toner's dropping, what it had on the squad and the team room. I, I, I imagine it wasn't great. And, you know, and the, the, losing a guy who'd been there for years like that. I just think it will go down as, as the big black mark on Schmidt's tenure. 
Is there so an important. argument? Is there an argument that Joe Schmidt didn't want to come out publicly and say, "I've looked at Devon Toner. He's not playing well enough in the pre-season matches, and I'm worried about his contribution to the scrum." Therefore, publicly at least, and in my book, I'm going to inflate my worries over this siding for the Rob Evans tackle to protect Toner's reputation. And that actually, that by doing all that publicly, Schmidt might have felt, well, he wasn't throwing Devon Toner and his next contract negotiation and everything else. He wasn't throwing Toner under the bus. He was trying to be as kind as possible publicly, and that actually showed a certain loyalty. Possibly, but it's very hard. Like, you don't want to put yourself inside Joe Schmidt's head, but I certainly took it as after the fact, a way of justifying his decision. Mm. And that's how Devon Toner takes it, based on the quotes today. I think he got it wrong, and this was a way of explaining it. But I like, know maybe, maybe he was trying to protect Devon, but... <clears throat> because he told Toner the truth. I mean, if we're taking the, you know, if we take Toner's recollection of the phone call as, as read, he is saying to him on the phone that he wasn't good enough in the pre-season games, that they needed a tight head lock. That is Schmidt's rationale. Now, publicly, he talks about the sighting. But clearly, he's given Toner the honest reason. I think I, I, it's the theme of the year, and you've talked about it on this programme before. I think Schmidt panicked as the year went on, and he thought, we're heading for South Africa in the quarterfinal, we need beef. Mm. And I think that was the reason he took Klein. And he, he w went away from something that had worked for him for how many years, you know? So, um, yeah, the, the good news is that Tone has responded brilliantly. He's playing really well this year. And, like, what is he, 33? But he, he says himself in the piece that he, he's in the shape of his life. So. You know, there is a bit of a bounce back story here, hopefully, because I mean, you just want him to do well. And you always feel more confident with Ireland run out if he's there. Mm. Today against Leon, by the way, and various journalists point this out today, his 243rd Leinster cap. So he's just 15 appearances away from breaking Gordon Darcy's all time record, which is quite some achievement. His last central IRFU contract is up at the end of the season. Ronan O'Gara was in touch, he was saying as well, when he got the bad news. Who did I talk to? Obviously, my wife. I got one of the best texts from Raj. Ron Nagar sent me a really, really nice text. That was unexpected. It meant a good bit to me. It was basically, don't let it define you as a player. You've loads of years left. Don't let this define you. Move on. I felt that was really good from him. And then all his contemporaries texted him as well. Where are you in the Joe Schmidt legacy as we put uh, 2019? Yeah, I was just talking to David to bed. I mean, I, I'd be a, a huge admirer of Joe Schmidt um, and all he's done for Irish rugby, but it's just... It's blow after blow after blow now. Do you know, the book went down very badly. Well, not off the shelves where, where it's been romping. But um, it just seems to be, you know, the way he's handled the fallout from the World Cup hasn't done him any favours. We've Rory Best book coming out. That, that whole Rory Best Schmidt back and forth was a bit unseemly as well. Um, so I think, I think history would be a lot kinder to Joe Schmidt. I think they look back at his overall contribution and remember that. But at the moment, we're still very raw from the World Cup, and the way he's, you know, he did the, he had to do a book tour. You know, a guy who's, who shies away from the media as, by de by definition, all of a sudden he's popping up on, mm. you know, loose women and all, you know, one in <laughs> Ireland, whatever. He, he was everywhere, and, you know, it just, it just it came across badly. I thought now, but he's okay. still like a, he's a genuinely decent bloke, and I, I just don't think that suited him, and I think his legacy. Unfortunately, has been tarnished at least in the in the short, in short term. So, in short, on the toner situation, if he had just come out and said, "Look, I want more beef in my pack, and I want a tight head lock specialist," I don't that know, would have been the way to no go. There's no viable reason Joe Schmidt could have given for leaving Toner. Out. I I don't believe. Like people look at us outside and you know, what do you know? Whatever we're inside, but this is like Ronan O'Gara texts him. They wouldn't be natural mates. You know, Toner might have been there at the end of Ronan's career, but this was an insult to Irish rugby. It was an insult. Like this, this affected people all the way down coaches around the country, small clubs, parachuted in South Africa with flimsy reasons. It was just a, and, you know, Joe maybe didn't get that. Now he does know Irish rugby, he's been here long enough, he was involved in Mullingar and stuff, but th this was a blow to the gut of the game in this country. Like that, I don't want to over egg it, but like, that's how big a decision it was, you know. Mm. And not vindicated given Klein's no. performance and then we at the see World what Cup, happened. Klein was putrid yeah. at the World Cup. He played against R Russia was about the height of it, wasn't it? And he was lumbering around the place. Now look, look, I've no Klein for Munster, no issue. Like he, he's played well for Munster. He's a big lump, mm. puts himself about. I have a major issue with him playing for Ireland, but he didn't produce at the World Cup, so ultimately, you know, the decision wasn't vindicated, as you said. Okay. Well, Devon Toner is across the papers and. As you said, he's a very reasoned fella. This is the equivalent of Devon Toner tearing off his T-shirt Hulk style, is it? That's <laughs> yeah. the level of dynamite we've got here. An image. And it's still quite... You'd just be rooting for him, you know, he's yeah. a really good guy and a hell of a player.
Uh, can we turn to your piece on Munster, page 74 and 75 of the Mail on Sunday, because this is quite damning of Johan van Graan, really, and we're talking in advance of the Rassi match. I know lots of people will probably come to this on Monday after the results. Yeah. But regardless, you're standing over what you found here. Yeah. The I vibe just, in Munster, not good. Well, it stems from, as you say, they could go out and do a, a Munster on, on Racing against the odds, you know, one of their famous back against the wall. They, they, they have a history of that. It's just in the wake of the defeat up in Ulster, um, which was humiliating. Um, I just rang around, you know, you, you'd have people who'd be close to the camp that you ring to get what's, what's going on. I just thought that was such a shocking performance. Now, admittedly, they're missing a chunk of guys that are playing against Racing. So, you know, you judge it that way. But the, there was, I mean, you've seen all the Munster players come out in the aftermath of that match talking about, you know, where was the dog, where was the traditional stuff. And when you, when you ring around and you dig down, there are issues there. I mean, this, this identity crisis thing has been knocking around for a while, both in terms of their style of play. Um, you know, traditionally, Munster were always direct, aggressive, and took it from there. And you knew what you were getting, but you couldn't stop it. Now, there's uncertainty. And the word coming back on Van Gran, who everybody likes, he, like, he's a very personable guy. The media like him. You know, he does this thing at, at press conferences where he shakes hand of everyone, which <laughs> and people put too, put too much importance on things like that, but it works. I mean, he hasn't got a kick in so far at a, to any degree. But the word is that he comes from a background of um, analysis, you know, uh, laptop, you know, studying all the, the moves and all that. And he's very good at it. And he, he had a reputation with the Bulls in South Africa on that basis. And the word is that his, his coaching is very scattered, is the word that it was described to me as, that people come out of it kind of going, well, what exactly are we doing here? And that. You know, that's, I'm just relaying what I was told. And when you look at them on the pitch, like against Ulster, they were all over the shop. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. Whereas Ulster were very direct. So there's that side to it. I also heard that he's, like, he's only a young fella. Like, he, he got the job at 37, I think. He's, he doesn't turn 40 till March. That's young, mm. coaching-wise. Players are only a few years younger than him. And he's, he's said to be, you know, very, um, maybe, not in awe of, but like influenced by the senior guys in, in the Munster squad, you know, the older guys and the younger players. And I know this from direct information that they feel he's been promising game time that he hasn't delivered on things like that. So there's that side to it. So and if you were winning, that's the kind of complaint that would be typical of any province. The younger players feel they're not getting their chance. Mm -hmm. Michael Cech and Johnny Sexton. Yeah, this yeah. is par for the course. But when you're not winning, mm -hmm. It was kind of all these things look like they win today and maybe it could turn around but there's a lot of stuff going on um and in terms of he's been there a while now and he you know you, you look at dan mcfarland what he's done up in ulster leo and stuart lancaster leo Cullen, stuart lancaster leinster andy friend at connacht they're struggling at the moment because of injuries but he, you know you know who's the boss van grand doesn't feel like it's my team i'm the man in charge you know he's got two big names underneath him now in roundtree and larkham mm. um I think coming out and saying I need more time wasn't the strongest move when you're there in your third season, do you know? Um, I don't want to damn the guy, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of disquiet on the ground. I, I'd be kind of close to the club game in Munster and they just don't see it there at all, you know? They, 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 there's a kind of a disconnect there, which relates into the other issue of identity in terms of the amount of imports they're relying on now and stuff, so. It's, yeah. it's, it's shaky enough, I think, down there. So you say, I mean, in your piece, you talk about uh, still young in coaching terms. Insiders suggest the head coach over-influenced by senior Munster players only a few years younger than himself. This is a source of frustration for the younger contingent, some of whom believe he's not followed through and mm. talk of greater frontline exposure. You talk about that detail as well, and mm. the scattered word appears here. You say that clarity is being lost beneath an avalanche of confusing detail. This would tally with Van Graan's coaching background with the Bulls in South Africa, where he was renowned for his technical analysis in front of the mm. computer, more than for his hands-on application on the training park. And then you talk about the identity. Munster have moved too far away from their representative past. You talk about the era of O'Connell, O'Gara, Stringer, Quinlan, Foley, host of others. That course still exists in the likes of O'Mahony, Murray, Earl, Scannell, and several more key figures, but it no longer seems to be the driving force consumed by the flow of imported talent from other provinces, notably Leinster and overseas. A whopping 14 of Munster's Champions Cup squad have been brought in from outside, which compares starkly to the mere five outsiders on Leinster's European roster. Indeed, of the 12 Munster players named in Andy Farrell's initial 45-man 
squad for the Six Nations. Only six were from the province, with CJ Stander, Jean Klein, Joey Carberry, Conway, Chris Farrell and Mike Haley all imported. Mm. Munster have suffered from a below-par academy system for too long. Yeah, no, there, there are... Um, that's improved in terms of some of the talent coming through, the, the Craig Casey, Finian and Richley, these guys. I mean, it, it, uh, Jack O'Sullivan's a guy to watch, actually. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, all the Caelan Doris, all the Leinster stuff, but he, he's, he's proper. Like, mm. his dad, actually, is, is Tiger Sullivan, Munster Doctor, would have been a very good number eight for Sunday as well, back in the day. So the next five years could signal a bit of an upturn? I hope so, but like, like you talked about detail there, you know, people I was talking to were, were com Leinster are the obvious comparison, which grates down Munster. I mean, yeah. they, like the, the years of, you know, the relish with which you put Leinster back in their box, because, you know, the, the fancy boys preening around. And Leinster have got it right so well. I mean, I talked there in the piece about Hugh Hogan, who uh, uh, would be well known on the club scene as a number eight for St. Mary's. He would have played Leinster A as well. He's a very good player. Um, He's there now as their contact skills coach. Yeah. Now, Munster don't have an equivalent of that, and the players are apparently are loving him. He's, it's, it's the minute detail of where you position your body for rock clearouts, tackles, carries, and you can see it the way Leinster play, uh, as I said in the piece, like the accuracy with which they play, which is missing in Munster. They don't have that. You talk about the academies, what was said to me during the week is that a small thing, but it, is quite stark is that Leinster have all their coaches on the one floor all you know the the offices or the desks are all on the one floor Munsters are two or three floors apart in their UL base you know so mm -hmm. there's kind of a collective <coughs> excuse me focus in Leinster that is missing in Munster and you, look you hope they turn around but I just I, th I think there's a disconnect there and it's worrying because you could always depend like people forget that Mun the provinces all the provinces but Munster were a representative team you know, you came out of the clubs and you played for your province, you were representing your club, family, friends, all that. That seems to be dissipating. And when the pressure comes on, mm. that thing, and it's, it's cliched and all that, the pride and passion stuff, but yeah. you know, O'Garan, Quinlan and these boys talk how, how potent it was. And it just, that seems to be diluted. And O'Garan, his piece in The Examiner on Friday, talked about how some lads had been thrown into the leadership uh, mm. group at Munster and really they didn't merit a position there that they just weren't up to it. Though you can see how, if you're Van Gran reading this, you would think, well, hang on, so you're, you're praising Leinster here for attention to detail and Hugh Hogan and skills coach and all the minutiae working mm. here, and yet I'm being attacked for having too much detail and being a brilliant technical coach. So which is it? That's a fair point, and, and I, I get where you're coming from, but I think it's, it's the focus with which Leinster do it. I think there's their system... You know, do you remember when um, Lancaster came in first, there was all this talk about he was the real coach of Leinster and all this? Like, it's rubbish. Like, Leo, the, the way they have streamlined the thing is just working beautifully down to that thing. And I think in Munster there's too much... You know, I mean, forwards coach is Roundtree, who's technically a scrum coach. Um, JP Ferreira is a specific defence coach. Mm. Larkin's doing the back, so what's Van Grand doing? You know, is he overseeing? I, what I'm hearing is that there's just a lack of clarity um, compared to Leinster. And, the, the, and to go back to the identity thing, like, the Leinster turnaround in that is remarkable. You know, they've, they feel like a team who, they, they must also be seen as weak, you know, kind of, um, do you remember the mid-2000s when yeah. they were blown away in Lansdowne Road, they were soft. Now there's a real, like, you could have 21 players in a squad of 23 from the province, proud to represent the province, and now there's gone beyond the D4 traditional environs. It's very impressive that that bit of, you know, dog is in them, which you saw as be absent, and it's diluting the Munster, which is the concern. Mm. Okay. Uh, listen, I, I'd love to see them win today, and I'd love to be proven wrong, and, you know, maybe victory could focus the minds and stuff, but this is what I'm hearing from mm. on the ground down there. From did you speak sports. to senior players? I can't. <laughs> that stuff. Do you get a sense that senior players are happy? Because it's in, it's in, notable the younger players feel they're not getting enough of a chance, which yeah. I would suspect is a complaint right across the board. Almost That's always the way. You're not getting picked. Yeah. You're going to have, have a pop. Like, I guess if, if he loses senior players, then he's in big trouble. I... I, I can't go into but I, I do think there's a sense that he, he's not putting his stamp on the team. Okay. Is that the, the issue? With obviously, looking at this from the outside and just going through what Farley's been saying there, you talk about, say, the culture, obviously that's important, but if he's not getting his messages properly <coughs> across on the training pitch and the players don't actually know exactly what's needed, that, that's the biggest thing of all, surely. Yeah. Like, I know, obviously, it's important to have that connection with supporters and an, an understanding, but if any player goes onto a pitch and doesn't know exactly what's needed yeah. within the system, that that's the most... 
damning thing of all. So he could be good in those technical aspects, but actually getting the message across. That, that's properly, a fair, like he knows he knows the game. You know, yeah. I mean, you see again to be fair to him, he's in his first senior head coach role, but he's into the third season. Munster have won the trophy since 2011. Mm. This, these are the guys who are the kings of Irish rugby, European rugby, and now it's pushing 10 years and this transition has been hanging around and people are sick of transition. And him coming out saying we need more time, and he does maybe, like Larkham and Roundtree bedding in, two lads arriving, South Africans arriving next year, uh, Alende and Snaman. But, you know, patience is worn thin on the time, the time plea, you know. Yeah, and the clock is ting ticking over that generation of O'Mahony and Earls. Yeah. And oh God, the, if you think Peter O'Mahony retires without a medal of any description. Oh no, he was there in 2011, was he? I think he might have come on after. Just on, a, on a different aspect for that, and not just saying it because Farley's here, but something like that in terms of the, the rugby, if you're not bang into it and you want to have an understanding and piece of that is very good because it's not just you kind of going off and talking about well this is what's wrong mm. you've actually put the work in and spoke I, I couldn't make those claims sense. without talking that's about because they're, yeah. they're big couldn't. claims yeah, big exactly. claims. You'd, you'd have to that's what and you know there's the issue of right to reply uh, uh, of course you know I am um, like you'll probably get a phone call you're not gonna you're not gonna well I'd happily talk to them but you, you couldn't get them now in the build up to a big game or anything but mm -hmm. these are coming this is coming from people around the camp no it's a sourced piece mm. it's very clear so that's in the mail, that's well worth a read. Just to briefly mention before we leave the rugby for a moment, Dennis Walsh on page eight has a good interview with Jack O'Donoghue, who in the midst of two wins in seven has still managed to play very, very well. Gordon Darcy is quoted in the Dennis Walsh piece. Gordon Darcy in the Irish Times was saying that this is high praise, perhaps too high, but I thought about Rocky Elson watching O'Donoghue in full flow over Christmas. He was the difference in a horrible night in Galway against Connacht. He has always possessed the raw materials to become an established Irish international or it could go another way, that's up to the man himself. He wasn't in the 45-man stock take, by the way, I don't know who, and he talks about that and talks about a bit of anger in his performance against Connacht. It's two years since he won his second cap for Ireland. That was on a summer tour of the US and Japan. He did, at the end of that season, injure his knee against Leinster. That put him out for 10 months. So he can cover any position across the back row. He's in his mid-twenties. Uh, Roy Scannell, the youngest player to reach 100 appearances for Munster, but he beat O'Donoghue by just uh, less than a month. So O'Donoghue has uh, racked up experience, even if he hasn't been recognised really at the international level. Uh, he's saying here, Hugh, in previous years, as opposed to this year, I'd get two games, then the internationals mm. would come back and I'm on the bench, not involved. You feel a bit sorry for yourself or you feel a bit down. Then you get an opportunity again and you're nervous. I don't want to make a mess of it. That's probably the big difference this season. And then the piece goes on and talks about how as a 14-year-old, really, he was into show jumping. And then he was at De La Salle and he was playing hurling and he's come to rugby quite late. Uh, does he have it within him to get into an Irish Six Nations squad and make an imprint this year? He's, first of all, do you not think he's the head of David Snaith, though? He's got that kind of rugged boyishness thing going yes, on. Yes, if you're listening, just imagine David Snaith. <laughs> sorry, 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 apologies. Um, <laughs> not quite the physique of Snaith. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Because no, um, he wasn't in that 45-man squad, which was uh, well, the problem a blow is, to him. The problem is we are awash, as always, with yeah. quality back rows. I mean, there's guys who aren't in the squad as well, like Matty Ray up in Ulster, Paul Boyle, who I think is a superb player and should be up there. Um, just can't get in because they're just queuing up, mostly from Leinster, to be fair. No, like, to go back to the identity thing briefly, like, he comes from Waterford. Waterford is a remote outpost of Munster Rugby. They, they had a senior club, Waterpark, mm. which is his roots. He says they had three in the, in the whole county. Yeah, yeah um, three clubs. Waterpark were, like, I think they, I remember um, playing, uh, Ben Cronin used to play for them. He, he would have got a few caps for Ireland as number eight. But beyond that, and Greg Tui was down there, I think he, he played a few times for Munster. But um, it's, we're, we're remote, remote, so to see him come out of there is great. Mm. But he's playing superbly at the moment. Um, and, he's, and, you know, it's a nice interview by Dennis Walsh, and he comes across well, and he has a good attitude. What can he do? He just keeps doing what he okay. can. But, I mean... Caelan Doris, Will Connors, now they're all talking about, you know, they're, they're just... Max Deegan's making a, a push Max again, Deegan's isn't he? superbly. And no one even mentions Dan Levy at the moment. Leave, and Levy to come back, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's nuts. So uh, that's uh, worth reading in the Sunday Times. There are various other pieces. David Walsh is writing about Saracens. Stuart Barnes, by the way, is very excited about what the French have to offer. Neil Francis has a piece on Ulster yesterday. Uh, talks about how once the scrum went, Ulster went, but does say that Cooney is now a better passer as well than Conor Murray and should be in the green shirt 
against Scotland. So there's lots of rugby coverage. David Snade, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> oh, no, this no. egg chasing nonsense yeah. to be done no. with. No, so I feel informed. <laughs> uh, where do you want to go? We have interviews with Jack Woolley. We have Manchester yeah. United, Manchester City pieces. There's GEA, Desi yeah, Farrell, yeah. amongst other things. So we'll give you a choice. I go, uh, I'm going to go with Jack Woolley in the mail. Okay. Mark, uh, Mark Allard, it's on page 62 and 63. Uh, the but, most common thing we say on the paper review is that Mark Gallagher has a habit of know, dreaming yeah. up interviews that nobody else seems to have dreamed up, and he's done it again. I know, and he, and he hasn't. Like, I know from a former colleague of mine, and just yeah, he's just constant bringing up these uh, these very quirky, not so much quirky, but just pieces that are off the beaten track a little bit, I suppose, and just people wouldn't have. Like I ne I'd never heard of this fella, uh, Jack Woolley, um, like Woolley or Woolley. Actually, you know, was it Woolley or Woolley? I think Woolley. Yeah. Um, it was like, so. I, I went down to the, the garage this morning and uh, bought the papers. And then, you, when you when you see a kind of when you see a kind of promoter on, on the back, you're sort of wondering it's obviously a good story. Mm -hmm. And then obviously it's like some opponents won't even shake my hand. So you're like, right, well, what's what's the piece about? And it's uh, just literally I have it here marked. I literally have nearly every paragraph every paragraph of the interview marked. It's about what 16, 16. You're you're subbing it away. Would have yeah. 1700 words. Yeah, cut, we had to cut a load out of it actually. And it was, right. There was 2,300 words there, and Mark had written 3,500. So basically, he leads in. So Jack Woolley does not want to be known as the gay fighter. He wants to be known as the lad from Talley who made history by becoming the first Irish person to qualify for the Olympics in Taekwondo. And it's kicking back, is the, the headline. Um, so this is a guy that we're all going to see in Japan. Yeah. He, as a 17 year old, he missed out on Rio, on Rio just. Yeah. And it was part of an RTE documentary. So the like key. It's amazing. So he actually came out on this documentary and said he was bisexual. And he's re he regrets it a little bit. Mm. Um, he sort of, he says it now that kind of, basically he'd only just come out to his parents and he was kind of, it was coming around the place in Tallaght and this, he'd obviously come out, mm. but his grandparents still didn't know. Um, kind of, it was obviously a great source of anxiety, which you would imagine. So obviously Mark meets him, which is again, it's not a big thing. It's not something that's done over the phone. There's a bit of, there's a bit of warmth to this piece as well, which you need when you actually meet someone. And he just said kind of, I just wish I never labelled it. Like I still don't like labelling it. People are just hell bent on giving everyone labels nowadays. And uh, without quoting directly, he goes, "I'm not, I'm not the Welsh rugby player in brackets, Gareth Thomas or the diver Tom Daly. They are big names and people talk about them. But if you notice, I didn't even know his name. He was just a rugby player. I, w I just want to be the first Olympian in my sport. The lad from Tala who went to the Olympics, not Jack, the gay athlete. Now you would think that's enough." For someone to be contending with that age, he's only just gone 21, mm. and then you read the rest of the piece and what he's been through in his life. With like without going through it, because we want we want people to read it, but stuff with his grandparents, stuff with his own brother, dealing with things with his own parents, then himself, and it's just it's just a story of just amazing perseverance and commitment to to just to his, his chosen sport and like clearly it was his way of life, like. I'm not going to give too much away on it because you really want people to read this, but he's like sacrificed so much from a personal point of view with his own family and missed out on some of the most gut-wrenching occasions of his life to be a part of, of a sport that some people don't even still accept him in because he's bisexual. And you're like, where this fella gets the actual, just the guts in himself to keep on going and what he's been through. Like he's been to see a sports psychologist mm. and you're just like, you want this, you, you, or you just can't wait to see this fella in action. Like he's going to be the sixth seed. And you just, it's, it's, it's one of those pieces that you kind of, you keep it away and when the Olympics comes around, you just want this fella to be a star and, and yeah, get the profile he deserves from what he's been through. And when he does talk about how he doesn't want to be like Gareth Thomas, whereby he says himself, I don't even know Gareth Thomas's name, I just know him as the gay rugby player. I know, yeah. I, say, I do not want to be the bisexual or the gay taekwondo fighter. Like, I really don't. And yet, you know, it, it's... The hook of the piece as but well. That, that, that was I, the issue because yeah. Mark rang me after. He, Mark only talked to him on Thursday night, and because we 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 got, we got him late in the week and told it around very well. He did, and the, he had he was working on all day Friday, and he was concerned how we how we put it across because he said Jack didn't want, as he says himself, he was reluctant to talk about the the sexuality issue. Mm. But once he did, he spoke brilliantly and he spoke at length about it. So it would have been wrong to ignore it, yeah. you know. Um, and like, you see, it's not that Jack Woolley can't talk about his sexuality. He can at length. His problem is when he does it, and he, even if he talks brilliantly, he becomes the headline is gay taekwondo fighter at the Olympics. That's why we try to, you know, we try to get away from the too obvious um, in headline and stuff. But 
him, him, what he said in this piece about about you know battling prejudice and all that would be hugely um, yeah. beneficial. You know, pe people will will take from that, as he says himself. You know, he hopes that you know he can be an example or or, or help inspire others. But he's inf I, what struck me and Mark said it as well when he spoke to him is that the guy's only twenty one. Well, I know he comes across as so mature because he could have been um, at the Olympics at 17. He does say that as a martial art taekwondo, it's a tough world, and Mark writes, Mark Allard, it's dominated by Muslim athletes. This brings its own issues. He has had opponents refuse to acknowledge him after bouts. Mm. Mm. It is tough, he says, my sport. A lot of the top athletes will be Muslim, so you can't be too open about it. I would have had some opponents who wouldn't shake my hand, and I'm just thinking you need to cop on. Some have, though. One of the top fighters in the world came up to shake my hand after I won the European silver. I appreciated that. Most people don't care, though, and they shouldn't care. It's only, a, it's only if you have a problem with me, then I'll have a problem with you. Maybe it can be good, maybe I can be an inspiration to some young, young people. And if someone wants to talk to me about what they're going through, then they can, but I'm not throwing it in your face. Like, isn't, that, isn't that brilliant, you know? Uh -huh. And like, you think, he says that uh, David alluded mm -hmm. to it there, he's, I think he's been to 43 countries. A lot of the times he, like, he's traveling on his own. Yeah. He's, he's yes. in these places like Moldova and stuff. You're a kid on your own and you're getting abused yeah. by people for, <coughs> for, your, for, your, for who you are. Like he misses like, like, he he miss the character. Like he misses Nana's funeral. Yeah. Just to go to an event that he had to qualify for to make sure that he could still continue. And then he went back just to give a medal he'd won to his ma so his ma could have it as one of the offerings. So he went home, gave the medal that he won, and then had to go off again and missed the funeral. And you're like, no, he's, how he's is he? A and serious like, young fella. But it's like, like, literally, I might, like you'll see, I actually marked nearly everything on it, but like one of the passages that I actually, there's a couple of bits that make you laugh, including a very dodgy sauna in Romania. <laughs> but, um, but he mentions about how, obviously, he goes to the Sport Ireland Institute out in Abbottstown. Mm. And like, he's like, so everyone's very, everyone is very friendly out there, but they all have their own groups. Uh, there are boxers in one group, swimmers in another, athletics. I'm the only ta taekwondo player out there, so I'm on my own. He goes, I do feel more comfortable now than when I first went out there. I was a skinny, I, I was a lot skinnier than I am now. So I was a skinny little kid from transition year and walking into this room with all these athletes with Olympic tattoos plastered all over themselves, six foot five, ripped, and here was me, a skinny little child, not knowing anyone. Mm. But then he goes, I'm still that skinny kid with no Olympic tattoo, but it was nice the other day. Everyone was congratulating me. You're like, man, like even that, even dealing with that, we are in that environment of all these fellas, and you see what's and, and women as well. But he still had that kind of gumption with himself to actually persevere and not feel overall too much, where he kept on going. And it's just it, 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 so it, the, reading this piece, it's a kind of a triumph of his own, of his own perseverance. Mm, but mm. he's so still a kid, not a kid. He's but you man, hope but he's so much more ahead of him, and he could be a very kind of um, well, he could be a four time Olympian, yeah. He could be a very and it could be one of the most very important figure in our sport going forward. And you, you hope given guys like this bit of profile gets them noticed and maybe more support, you know, and yeah. Like that, that's what you look at. And Mark, like you talk how Mark wasn't nominated for the Journalism Awards, I, I have no idea that they're, they're I have my doubts about how they're. I know Kieran Cullen has talked about that as well, but. He goes after these type of things that he just constantly produces, and he's brilliant. Yeah, page sixty-two and sixty-three of the Mail on Sunday. We'll be seeing Jack Woolley come Tokyo twenty twenty. By the way, Taekwondo is Korean martial art. I like that this was in the corner because I mean I know Taekwondo, but I don't know Taekwondo yeah. is the point. Taekwondo, Korean martial art, emphasizes kicking. Originated in Seoul shortly after the Second World War. It's been an Olympic sport since two thousand. You're fully padded as fighters. The head and the body are the legitimate targets. All kicks are scored electronically. Fighters wear special sensor socks to check when they've landed kicks. So they have three two-minute rounds. Kicks to the body score one point. Kicks to the head score three points. And my favorite bit, if kicks are done with a spinning technique, the fighter gets an extra two points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes you want to watch it, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Punches to the body score a point. Like there's, there is so much in it again, with, and, but, and it's not going to take away from anyone reading it, but again, another, another line, and it goes back to kind of the stereotypes, and he says, like, people assume a lot about you when you're given a label. They'll say you're very flamboyant or whatever, but the thing is, I kick, I kick people for a living. <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. I'm going to come to Manchester United and Manchester City in a moment, because I know if I start you on those, then we may never get off them, David Snaith. So mm -hmm. I'm jumping to GAA for a moment. Desi uh, yeah. Farrell is in the papers. Jack Anderson, by the yeah. way, has a really good piece on Colin McShane. I thought this was very informative because none of us are exactly sure what might face Jack or what might, might face Colin McShane when he goes over to Australia. So Jack Anderson is based over in Melbourne. Yeah. He's a director of sports law studies at Melbourne Law School. There's lots of GA in the papers today. We'll come to Colm O'Rourke, by the way, mm. who is actually saying that semi-professionalism, we are now at a point in the game where semi-professionalism would be a better idea 
than what we have now. So he says, someday we could have Google North Dublin against Facebook Dunleary wrapped down. Now, I thought initially he might have been joking when I read that line, but actually he's deadly serious. Mm. We'll come to that in a second. Uh, GEA fixture Farago is sparking a bigger player drain than Lure of the AFL. This is Jack Anderson, and he's obviously making the point that, frankly, it's the shambles that is the GEA fi fixture list which makes the AFL very tempting as much as the lifestyle over in Australia. He's saying here in uh, Melbourne, heart of AFL, there's been very little interest or coverage in Colin McShane, given the bushfires and given the Australian Open. But he says, where we are at the moment in Australia, uh, 17 Irishmen are on the AFL clubs list in 2020, and there are 18 Irish women playing in the AFLW competition, which, which starts uh, next month. So he says, ironically, given the connections between the two islands, there are now almost as many Irish players in the AFL as there are Tasmanians in the league. And he talks about the equal distribution of broadcast money, American-style draft system as well, where the league's least successful team in one season gets first choice on young talent in the next, and there's a salary cap. So he says McShane is going to, given the pl powerful players' union, he's going to get about 80,000 Australian dollars a year with limited potential for bonuses. Uh, the important point, he says, though, is that rookie salaries are not part of the salary cap. So rookies are less expensive than official draft pick. If you pick somebody through the official draft, that's going to cost you a $100,000 base salary and more than 4000 for a senior match. So obviously, if you pay 80000 to McShane, it's much cheaper and it doesn't affect your salary cap. Hence, he says, in a commercial sense, the Irish players are a low-risk, high-return investment for AFL clubs. McShane will likely uh, be sent to the Development League in South Australia to see if he can make it to Adelaide senior list. If not, he'll be cut. And that is a good summary of why they've gone after someone mm. McSh Mc for, uh, like McShane. They have to pay him less, <coughs> doesn't affect their salary uh, cap as well, and they don't lose all that much either. If he doesn't make it in this lower league, then he'll just be cut, simple as. Yeah, like it's a very good piece. It's very mm. informative. Uh, Shane McGrath's talking about it as well, and he's a good piece. And I think the Colmar Rook piece is, is related to it. Um, like as you as you outlined there, it it just makes sense from an Australian point of view, and it's a no brainer from an Irish point of view. Mm. And even <coughs> excuse me, even Jack's last paragraph: every game that Colin McShane could potentially play for his AFL club in 2020 has already been scheduled and fixed. Could you say the same at home? It's a no-brainer for me. Do you know, I mean, you're getting again. money. You, you're, <laughs> you're getting money to do what you're doing at home, and and there's a, there's a structure to it. There's a sense to. There's a coherency to it that's missing. Mm. Like, is it 60 players have gone? Is yeah, it, that um, is. Yeah. Like, officially, what do they expect? You know, I mean, and that. The, uh, this goes back to Colin O'Rourke saying bringing semi-professionalism, but so explain this. So Colin O'Rourke and yeah. so that's uh, Jack Anderson's piece is very very good. It doesn't really go bear much analysis, but he really lays out why the AFL teams go for Irish players and has all the facts <coughs> and the figures. Over on page nine, Colin O'Rourke has been a long time critic of where the game is, but I've missed the few steps in between him saying we need to fix things as they currently stand and jumping all the way towards advocating almost semi-professionalism tearing up the county system, having maybe three or four teams in Dublin. I, I think it's great. Like, I, I love Collins where, like, I, you try and do it, and they would be the same, where if you're giving out about something, well, give me a solution. Like, you know, this is a bit mad. Like, it's a bit <laughs> crazy, but I love it, you know? Like, Google North Dublin against Facebook yeah. Dunleary Rattown. Um, like, that sounds like the worst possible well, conclusion. He, he, he changes it up, plan. he says, um, um, players are not fools. They realise the league is a competition where they can make some progress, but the championship is a dead duck. Hmm. Um, Mickey Hart has been given out of the McShane thing, the Tyrone boss. Does, does Hart or any of the others who complain about players going to Australia have any f feelings for this much larger group? Yes. So that's kind of tease it up. And yeah, he's he, saying we're, we're, says, we're, we're all talking about McShane going to Australia as if it's the big problem. The actual problem is all the players walking away from the game. Yeah, yeah. and he, he's advocating, well, he, no, he's, he's not saying it's going to happen or like he, he's throwing it out. <laughs> Sorry, there. Hugh, it's absolutely not going to happen. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but um, the, to base on the AFL model, and he goes into the detail of that, but like. Money has to come into it, it has to, and it's there already under the counter maybe, or you know, through expenses or whatever. Mm. But the county system can't work in a professional arena. So he's suggesting there's a 12 to 14 Teams, franchises, yeah. which is just mad. Like, so you'd have you know, three, two in Dublin, is it? And he says the GA could have a semi-professional league based on this model. County teams would disappear. He says, we'd yeah. have 12 or 14 teams. They'd all play each other during the season. Naturally, there would be at least one Dublin side, maybe two or three, one in Kerry, Mayo, Galway, Tyrone, other centres where a team could be supported. The reality would be 50 or 60 players in Dublin would be snapped up. 
he obviously says all the players that play now couldn't be supported, but 50-60 alone in Dublin would be snapped up. Perhaps the final someday could be Google North Dublin against Facebook yeah. and Larry rat down, or it could still be Meath against Kerry. He says the type of league has many advantages. First of all, it would remove teams from under the auspices of county boards and save counties a fortune. He talks about the money wasted in the county game, that 95% of the money would go back into the game. He says the hassle over conflicts with the third level under 20s, other competitions would instantly disappear and young players would strive to get into the big league. Uh, for Manny, he says the thought of such a move is heresy. But he says we now have a system where the rich have nearly devoured the poor. Uh, I would still prefer a heavily reformed GAA to this semi-professional model, but, he says of the semi-professional model, it would be better than what we have at He's present. He's talking about a franchise. He's talking about the IPL, you know, the, the Indian 2020 yeah. oh, thing. Yeah. So you could have a guy, I don't know, Conor Callaghan playing for, you know, the Cork Tigers or whatever. You know, like, it'd just be, or like the American football, it'd just be franchises. The Elvary's Eagles in Mayo. The Beamish, yeah, the you know, I mean, it's, 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 I love this kind of stuff because you start, and these are the type of conversations that have to be had for stuff to change like as you said it's not going to happen mm. but I mean you know the, the 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 problem is the counties you know we have 32 counties each one has a different accent which is nuts considering the size of the country <laughs> you know which is like a, a 20 the size of Texas where they all speak the same accent but you know it's defining and the GA is the defining thing that separates it they'll never go away from that it's just how to work it out but I, I love this type of you know speculation and stuff I think it's a really good read very interesting entertaining read it, it, when you tie it in with what you're saying about the rest of the stuff about players just walking away from mm. inter-county football and like it's just like, it's in a bad place is, is GA in a, in a bad place here at the moment where there's yes. just a total like we're, you're saying there about a disconnect with, with Munster where there's just a total disconnect between the top of the game in terms of inter-county teams and the club teams and like I, I have mates who would play for, for small enough clubs like well like in say around Blanchardstown and stuff and like these lads give their lives to their club like and they don't they know they're never gonna get near Crow Park unless they're on the hill watching the dubs or whatever and it just there just seems to be a major disconnect and then like there's Mick Foley on page nine is talking about kind of players need reasons to stay and like the intro to it is very good where he just says like maybe the most worrying thing for the GAA in the explanations for the mounting number of sabbaticals being taken by inter county players this winter was the absence anywhere of a rebellion. <coughs> Excuse me. Um like so basically just this is something like normally people are, like players are walking away because they've they as if they've got no other choice. Yeah. Like when his, Mick makes a point, he says like their decisions are personal and based on personal need, not a selfless gesture of defiance against a dysfunctional system. Whatever competition structure is, exists, the same root problems would exist. That's the message from the last few weeks everyone needs to hear and where all attention should be focused. And then you go down to the, the last paragraph, mm. which sums it up really. In amateur sport, no matter how su um, souped up Gaelic, player, Gaelic games might appear, players will always come and go. Creating an environment that makes them feel good about staying is the challenge. And obviously he mentions, that, like, there's the player here, the uh, Antrim hurler Simon McCrory, who talks about his reasons for walking away and... Like, I know obviously you're talking about, about loving that, the kind of, the, kind of the, the wackiness yeah. of Colin works, but it, it, this is a, it's a serious issue for that, the GA, I have to... But well, money has to be you McCro were saying McCrory said, by the way, seeing as you mentioned his reasons, he was mm. talking with the Irish News this week, he said, I can only speak... And this is like a player which doesn't make a massive headline, you know, really. Yeah. It's not like an, a, a, a kind of uh, somebody that you're likely to see on a billboard as you drive through town. I can only speak from experience. Being an intercounty player has put a strain on my family life and any relationship I've been involved in because you barely see each other. Mm. I worry about the support the counties give to players in terms of where they're going and he's decided to step away like this, it just it feels at odds with what the whole point of like you hear about this the great girls Gaelic games about the community and all the rest of it he's clearly making the point <coughs> excuse me that it's actually impacting on his life so rather than being a positive focus of his life mm. it's actually having a, a very detrimental and negative yeah and so yeah sorry, surely like that's the start something like that is what the top brass in the GEH be looking at it and saying, no, this But if he was given proper compensation, would that change? I mean, you were, you were saying outside that, you know, these guys must be looking around at nutritionists, I know, conditioning yeah. coaches who are all got on a wage, and then managers the and so. I, Like, it's been around for years, but if you were getting, if the system could be worked out to compensate from the top down, mm. A, an equitable I, wage would it would it keep players? I don't know if it's just about giving them a wage. I, I, it's 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 what Mick says here at the end. It's just about creating that environment that makes them feel good about staying. So like, yeah. maybe lads I, will, lads will accept. I, I, that maybe they're not going to make it. They're not going to like Gaelic games. It's not about your profession and that's your job. But it can't be 
to the detriment of your life where you have to put things on hold. Mm. But I would Just worry, I, so say we all say, okay, let's give them a wage. Yeah. So how much money is actually in the game is a, is a worry. Like our lads who are, you know, they, there was a recent ESRI study it's and more of a gulf. 60, 70 percent of intercounty players have gone to university, which is much <coughs> higher than the average person in the street. So how much money are you going to offer these fellas? Like realistically, so are you going to expect very intelligent uh, young intercounty players to almost, uh, I mean, if they're sacrificing their career now, they'd completely mm. have to sacrifice it if they're being paid a few quid. So here's three or four or five hundred quid a week, and you need to put your life on hold for us. That's mm. not a good solution. That's what like there's rugby initially. Yeah, well, initially, yeah, yeah. There's I mean, match fees and stuff like that, you know. But you, like there's. You have to start somewhere, do you know? But I mean, how many. <sighs> Give people the option, like, uh, you know. I mean, do, they're putting so much time into it if they want to. But you see, the, th the thing about rugby is that eighty or ninety percent of the revenues come from, say, Six Nations mm -hmm. games and huge amount of sponsorship money. I mean, I'm not sure that's there yeah. to fund two hundred players around the country. Like, you are getting rid of the county system. Then, if you're going yeah. that route, you're paying them five, six, seven, eight hundred quid. Do you have to get rid of the county system? Could you have a central fund and? <sighs> it's a lot of money then, like to justify. These, these, to justify these fellas giving up their work to play for their county. Yeah. Like, I just think we better be careful what we wish for here because we're you're, heading, you're, you're not going to pay them much money. Are we not edging closer and closer with each piece like this? You know, it, like, it, it has to be, mm. these things have to be discussed now. But these are issues, again, just from the outside looking at, you have always been here in the last number of years that people are talking about this constantly. Yeah. So you, you mentioned there about like no no GA player if you say oh we we'll give you three or four five hundred quid a week mm. and that's your job mm. like Lee Chain didn't Lee Chain walk where he kind of was a full time athlete effectively, yeah, yeah effectively like whereas I just don't think it's it's not going to be feasible like no it's, it's a it's, bad idea the game of games is a, it's it's a great sport on on our island but it's surely it's, so it's not going to be I don't know because I have a lot of sympathy I have a lot of sympathy for the GA because what do you do when for six, seven, eight, nine years of, of, of a player's life in his 20s, it is the most important thing to him. And you have the Kieran McGinney types in the world who want to sacrifice everything, who want to eat perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Who, like this, to, to win an All-Ireland for them is the most important thing for that seven, eight, nine year window. And they want to train six days a week. Mm. How can you facilitate uh, the Kieran McGinney types who will put their GA ahead of everything versus somebody who's saying, oh, well, I want a sense of well-being and I want to train twice a week. Yeah, I don't know how you mix all that in and make Can that anyone compatible. do that anymore at the top level? Can Probably I, not. There, there's more. There's enough Kieran McGinnies there to people, sustain. Are there people getting up, going to work, teams. going to the gym, then going to work nine to five, then going training six days a week? I mean, Probably. Yeah, like, yeah. So, so what? So what do you do if you're a very good player, but you turn around to your teammates and you say, "Look, you guys want to train before work and train after work and do this for four, five, six days a week. I can't. I'll train Tuesday, Thursday, yeah. and I'll go to gym once a week. Can I do that?" And then you can't have different people in a team doing different yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's always, it seems, there's always going to be just about enough players by the looks of things who are willing to make the sacrifices and then they reach a breaking point. And they go to Australia. Or they go to Australia or they walk away from the game mm. or they just fall away from the inter scene because they have to prioritise mm. their work. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the foolhardiness of the foolishness of youth, there are enough lads who are 22, 23 who are willing to say, I'm going to make Is this the most important thing. Though? Like, well, I wonder actually. Because I the, the theme from all these pieces from Shane and Colm and, and Jack is that <laughs> this is going to, this, this ain't stopping anytime soon, you know, this drain. So, yeah. Well, when you're getting two matches a year potentially in the championship, yeah. it's not much that's of a what, carrot. That's what some of the times it's so bizarre about this is that, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's for two games a year. Yeah. yeah like, but again, like, but it seems like the, the horses bolt in this week years. Like, the lads are effectively professional, like, and the airport, like, as you say, like, lads are willing to do it. and some people don't want to do it, well then fair enough, they walk away and eventually though, maybe kind of, if you get enough lads who actually say, well do you know what, it's just actually not worth the hassle. Mm. Well, it, that, what is a bit that, crazy though Dave is that, like, like I think um, in the Dublin match yesterday, Desi Farrell's first game in charge, he, he picked a team of Farrell's fledgings they were calling them, because the, the squad were on holiday in Bali, but the lads, <coughs> the lads been training since November, isn't there? Like they, they, they've started that four of the two games a year, eight months later. I mean, maybe you should look at that as well. Mm. You know, are you breaking people too much with that kind of stuff? You know. Yeah. Poor Joyce was on. Start, start in January. Like. Poor Joyce was on recently and said there's just no need to be training yeah. in November to peak for a game in May. Yeah, it's crazy. And who, who, when did that become the way to do things? Who decided since that? A new manager came in and had a meeting with a bunch of very eager 23-year-olds in the main and said, lads, will we give this an unbelievable shot? We will. Right, brilliant. 
and then the, you know they do it for a few years and then the next batch come through yeah, yeah. And, and on you go. Yeah. You wanted to mention Not it, fast. Desi Farrell gets a bit of attention. I mean, geez, for like an O'Byrne cut I know, match in gonna, January. I was going to say... It, Desi Farrell's got a little glimpse of the attention and scrutiny that's going yeah, to be on him. Ma like match reports of this game, but it's obviously not just match reports, it's de kind of detailing the, the nature of obviously Desi Farrell now taking on this job. Mm. Gordon Mannon in the Sun, obviously Roy Curtis in the Sunday World, and Michael Foley in the uh, in the Sunday Times. This was very, this was great lines from different parts, like in fairness, like was, you mentioned the Wolf Tones, the Black and Tans, the ROC, you've got Stormont mentioned. You've got obviously some of the lines. About, you've got Wolverine mentioned here by, by, by Roy Curtis. By Roy Curtis yeah, um, there's just just, just some, some great lines in it. But it, it's like what you were tying into earlier. It's like even like obviously the dubs, basically the lads who won the All Ireland again, or were off in Bali, and it's effectively a D and E team. Yeah. Bang on for them. They only lost by a couple of points in the one point. One point. No, well, a couple of points that were scored in the last couple of minutes, oh, wasn't sorry, it? Yeah, one yeah, point, yeah. yeah. But um, but there was a good line from. Um, from Michael, which sort of sums it up, where he says, uh, when nearly all his players tripes him back from Bali, Farrell fielded a team that made him the most recognisable dub in the ground. Mm. Um, and then, like, Gordon Mannon's intro was pretty good. It's like, uh, trouble between opposing factions, police restoring calm, and a return of power of a f and the return to power of a familiar face. No, not the Stormont Assembly, but Desi Farrell's first game in charge of the D Dublin senior footballers. I mean, it, it does seem like Mick Foley touches on this as well. A dub supporter picking fist fights with the locals and ranting about black and tans on the terrace. It's been that kind of week, hasn't it? And the referee running a gauntlet of Dublin supporters as he left the field, irritated by a handful of frees that granted lo a Longford passage to the to the O'Byrne Cup final, much forever once more. It seems like it was a feisty enough. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like it, it's just it's but it's interesting as well. You talk about uh, there's a bit of a team here with with, with managers. And um, like Desi Farrell now, it's going to be interesting to see what, what he actually does. Like Roy Courts obviously knows him and he kind of, there's good lines here where he says like, he's a natural born competitor, one who captained about a Dublin football and Irish hockey team within months of surgeons taking one look at his busted knee and the, delivering the forlorn prognosis that his sporting career was over. And then there's a quote from him where he says, I've always taken the approach that, two, that there's two ways to, to live your life. One as a timid soul, sort of year by year, month by month, week by week, possibly even hour by hour as a timid soul, or the other is to perhaps do the thing that frightens you at times, that's this thing that stimulates me, it challenges me. So, like I was listening to a podcast during the week where um, Jamie Carragher and Stephen Gerrard, and it was very good, it was actually, I actually didn't think I'd be giving a plug for Jamie Carragher's podcast, but it's great about just properly getting into talking about football, but he had Gerrard on, and he was talking about, is it easier to come in as a manager when the shit has hit the fan a little bit and you've, you're going to get a bit of time, or at the top where you're expected to just continue mm -hmm. the dominance. So that's what's going to be interesting there with, with Desi Farrell is, like, what's he going to, he, he, he can't just do what Jim Gavin done, he's his own man, he's going to do his own things, but does he just make little tweaks here and there? Does he try and just keep things going and have that kind of consistency? Because from looking on the outside again, like, you don't think that needs to actually change. Mm. It, it is. Like, he has to put his own stamp on it at the same time. So. Like this game, in effect, doesn't matter. He actually says himself, "I'm actually relieved to be out of it, so now he can get to get to work." But it's when all these other lads come back, yeah. and like I don't know when he'll begin to really <coughs> mould his own own squad. But that aspect of you're talking earlier about said the identity, all these players who will have will be used to what what Jim has done. But he has to bring in his own people a little bit who are who will buy into what he wants to do. He has to get these fellas to buy into what he he wants to do, and. Like he can't. Like I know he's lost this game, but there's going to be like they're going to play Kerry in the league soon, aren't they? So there's there's going to be big questions straight away, and he mm. has to be able to just keep the show on the road because there's a generation of Dublin supporters who are just so used to used to success. And, and they were I obviously they were obviously cranky yesterday. But like yeah, one, yeah. one thing that lost in the mix is actually it's a hell of a win for Longford, does not it? I mean, is, yeah. is that is that uh, Mickey Mouse competition, whatever? But it, what Dave says is interesting because like ultimately. This game doesn't really matter, right? It was it was, it was a twenty three substitutions. Yeah, yeah. Team young for us, you know. So what? But in the climate of change, maybe just a whiff of uncertainty around Dublin. Do you know? It just kind of adds to the little. Maybe they're not as impregnable as they were with Jim Gavin gone. Mm. So, you know, I think it'd be, I, I don't think he'd be thrilled to have lost first up, regardless of the of the circumstances. And it is curious, but like again, like Mick Mick Fowdy in the Sunday Times says, like Farrell must now be Dublin's PR, the rock on which Dublin must build a long lasting church, hoping to avoid crucifixion. Was like, where Gavin's final year was dedicated largely to getting one last squeeze from an, an incredibly talented and highly decorated panel. Farrell knows change must happen. So, like, there's obviously maybe there are bigger issues 
Lorca and the knees with Dublin that need, need to be addressed. But it's like, again, Tony, same with Man United, when Ferguson finished up and then David Moyes comes in, you start thinking, well, just carry it on. Like he'd won the league with 12 points. Mm. The great Liverpool team back in the day, again, with, with Kenny Daglish, but then they just fall off fall off a cliff. Like, yeah, surely I can't imagine something like, like I don't think the the pool of, of rivals is quite the same in terms mm. of in, in Gaelic games because most of them are obviously fecking off to Australia. But like, uh, yeah. it's going to be interesting though just to see if like the Dubs are that force whereby just teams are f the fear factor. Like, would would players all of a sudden say, yeah, Dublin are there for the taking just because Jim Gavin isn't there? You would have always thought it was just that. The whole point point is that they have such a depth of depth of talent. But how much does the actual manager then cre create that sense of just? impenetrable kind of success because you just you looked at even though it was obviously tight games but has anyone really properly ever said yeah they're definitely good they've got the mate they've got the beatings of Dublin because their team now only going to ask them I don't know like no there's never there hasn't been a game Dublin have gone in not as favourites yeah but is that will that happen now Luke do you think no okay not yet no I think it'll be a surprise when it happens if it yeah, happens yeah. this year still Mm. Maybe surprise is too strong a word. But. So it could be interesting to see what happens now in terms of... Oh, it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to be brilliant. Uh, before we wrap things up, a few bits of football coverage that we wanted to touch on. So a uh, piece which caught your eye, caught my eye as well, actually, is Jonathan Northcroft <coughs> on page five of the Sunday Times. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's Sergio Aguero. Yeah, Sergio. It's kind of interesting. So, like, he's talking about how this evening at the Savoy, the Football Writers Association are going to have an annual tribute awards gala dinner type thingy for Vincent Company. And he was saying one player who'll probably never ever get that is Sergio Aguero. Uh, basically, and I was kind of unaware of this, I think a lot of people were, if Aguero scores against Aston Villa today or when he scores his next goal, he's going to overtake Thierry Henry, which many people thought would be impossible, really, as the most yeah. prolific foreign scorer in English top flight football. Aguero's got 174 Premier League goals for City. Henri's got 175 in slightly fewer appearances, at 254 to Henri's 258. So it's not like he's just played more games. Mm. He has really kept pace with Henri. And he was drawn, you know, further in the comparison. Henri has been uh, the Football Writers Association Player of the Year three times and was the first to be the PFA Player of the Year in consecutive years. Aguero has, well, he's never been PFA Player of the Year and he's only scraped on to the PFA yeah. Team of the Year twice. That's which is uh, a bit surprising, I have to say, yeah. He's both appreciated but also underappreciated, Aguero. Yeah, it's, it's like, and Nork, Jonathan Norcroft makes the point, he says um, he kind of, maybe the, his issue is he's simply too efficient, too monotonously good. He's the Novak Djokovic of the Premier League, the, the uh, industrial achiever for whom love is begrudged. And... Like obviously, if you're, you can't really compare obviously Henri with, with Aguero because they're two completely different players. Aguero is <coughs> purely a poacher, isn't he? Like he's yeah. like there was talk. Remember when when Guardiola came in that he was gonna they brought in Gabriel Jesus and it looked as if Aguero was gonna be on the way out. And that's maybe another indication of just how good he is. Where he actually was able to say he was able to kind of make Guardiola realize well actually I need Aguero like for all the the pressing and. He, Obviously, he, he does do it, but Guardiola realised, actually, I need, yeah. I need Sergio Aguero. And like, when he would have came into the Premier League, you're sort of thinking, ah, he'll go there for the money for a couple of years and then he'll go off to Barca or to, to, Real, to Real Madrid. Mm. But, but he stayed and obviously he's been well compensated. He, he's been successful. Um, but there's an argument that he's probably one of City's greatest ever players. I think Alan Shearer, Alan Shearer was derided recently for saying that Aguero is the best foreign player in the history of the Premier League and basically I saw nobody agree with that. Opta talks about the Henri comparison. Yeah. Uh, he's scored more goals as well with his wrong foot, more headers, yeah. more goals away from home. Uh, talks about goals in big games. So he's scored nine against Man United, seven against Liverpool, 11 against Chelsea. He's never been an Eden Dzeko fattening his account with the oh, yeah. fourth and fifth goal in a 5-0 romp. And it, as well, if he had been playing during the week, he probably could have had a double that tally against United because yeah. uh, he would have had a field day. But, um, yeah, like, but even, like, <coughs> like, obviously you're comparing with Henri because he's currently at the top of the list. They are two completely different, two completely different players. But mm. just, I just think it even... His, his effect and his impact on City, I'd say him and like obviously Yaya Torre, like not so much obviously like obviously there's the goals, but a player of that caliber who's just stood around or stayed around, and that's that's what's helped kind of keep City at that that level as well. Obviously they, they brought in Guardiola and stuff, but like when you have a player like that, that's what keeps you at that level in terms of like not just going for the money a couple of years and and then going to a Madrid. Yeah. So like that's that's been key and like, but it's it's very interesting though is the fact that. 
like not, not so much say football writers because I don't think he'd be too fussed if he get an award from the journalists. I don't think they, they are really poor. It is still interesting that maybe his own player, the players haven't sort of um, recognised him. Recognised. I'd imagine he would have lost out the year when Van Persie single-handedly won United the league in Ferguson last year. And, but then like that moment is in the the Aguero moment with mm. Martin Tyler. Um, it's just been, it's just been an incredible career. He will obviously he's got he's got to break that record, and then you just think. If he wins the Champions League, if he's going to be helping win the Champions League this year, that would just put him on a on a completely different level. And like I, I don't think he's the best. Was it what did you say? Best foreign player in the. I still don't think so. He's probably the best in terms of a striker. If he scores the most goals, you have to you have to put him up there. But you, you, you look at some players who kind of transform the the Premier League. I don't think he's sort of done that. Like, you know what I mean? Like in, in the last couple of years, it's been so more, more so managers who've done that, like Guardiola and Klopp have, yeah. they're the ones who, who have done that, you know? He's the most under the radar 174 Premier League yeah. goals striker there's but been. He's, just to he's finish. far too old for highlights. Uh -huh. He's far too old for, for highlights. highlights. Well, that's that's the, the, the key <laughs> point, of course. Just before we wrap this up, uh, Klopp coming against us, uh, just to mention Jonathan Wilson, we don't have to labour this point at all because it's a fairly uh, digestible one. Basically, he's talking about City during the week against Man United, and he was saying there is, you know, a perception City aren't at it this year, and maybe they've lost some of their edge. So he's looked at the stats, and if you're under the impression that City just aren't quite working as well or working as hard this year, he says the stats belie that. In every metric to gauge pressing this year offered by Opta, high turnovers, press sequences, opposition passes allowed per defensive action, how high up the pitch a team begins open play sequences. City are as good, if not better, than last season. So actually, Wilson's conclusion is, it may really just be as simple this year as they lost a central defender in company, then the injury happened, and then they're stuck with Otamendi and John Stones, and the thing has sort of fallen apart. So if you look at City in most ways, most metrics, they are working just as hard this year. This isn't a team that under Guardiola and his intense ways have fallen off ever so slightly. And he makes the argument they'll be back next year, plus Liverpool are phenomenal, which that's makes really things well, difficult. But that's, that's the deal I refer to. Like Liverpool are just on a different level at the moment in terms of, of, in terms of their consistency. Mm. And like Liverpool have been able to deal with their injuries a little bit better than City. Like, like, I know they've obviously lost company, but losing Laporte as well was, was huge. As soon as Laporte you know, went, was yeah. injured, you worried yeah, for them. Yeah, and exactly, like, yeah. Liverpool just haven't let up. Now, clock is really against us. Man United then. So there's two aspects here. There's Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, which I know you have in front of you here. Yeah. And then just well, to, it's a to talk about it. I know you are. It's, <laughs> it's a good piece on page five. It's a small piece. Jonathan Northcroft again here. But he's just talking about Ed Woodward and United and where they are. So basically, what is notable is that on Tuesday against Manchester City, I know it's Carabao Cup, but it's still Manchester City, that there were 7,000 empty seats and that was despite a dumping of thousands of tickets on general sale after it became clear many season ticket holders were going to miss the match. They put uh, tickets on sale for £66, which Northcroft <laughs> says was larcenous so soon after Christmas. So uh, it was a further signal to the Glazers and Woodward that they can no longer treat fans as uh, cash cows. Talks about how the average gate at Old Trafford last season was 74,000. That was the lowest figure since 2009-10. It's going to be lower again this year, 73,000 on average. As few as 50,000 turned up for that Astana match. And he was saying as well this week, Liverpool announced a new kit agreement with Nike. It's set to eclipse United's record Adidas steel. Another gut punch to the Glazers. So it seems that the frailties on the pitch <coughs> are now starting, at last it seems, to manifest themselves away from the pitch. Because for the last couple of years, Ed Woodward was justifying his £3 million salary by saying, well, we're making more money than everybody else. And it, it was even saying here, profits have lagged now behind Spurs is 112 million and <laughs> Liverpool's 98 million last year. So away from the pitch, United are starting to suffer financially, which you, know, you feel was always going to happen. There were a few uh, get Ole Gunnar Solskjaer out pieces, including you have Eamon Sweeney there, do you? Yeah, um, Tommy Conlon's on it as well. And, and there's a theme across the papers. I, I, I suspect these were written after the City game because obviously they won 4-0 yesterday. So. You know, that happens. It wouldn't strike you as the time to write this. Solskjaer must go no, after yeah, the 4-0. No. And look, um, Tommy and Eamon are excellent columnists. A like, the key is, like, if you read a column, you want to come out, you know, <coughs> with it registered in your head. And Eamon certainly does that. I just have an issue. Like, he, the way he writes, you zip through it as ever. He's a very good writer. But I have an issue with the content. I just think it's... What's he arguing? I just think it's way over the top. Like, he goes in straight off. Nobody really believes Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is the man for the job at Old Trafford, so straight away, like, you're, you're there. And then he compares them variously to 
Lawrence Armstrong, um, sticking with him is like, he compares him to John Terry sleeping with Wayne Bridge's wife. And then he compares him to Count Dracula, like he calls him the undead. <coughs> Do you know? Like I just think, I just it, think. It's... And now, hang on. In fairness, he doesn't compare him with John Terry. No, sleeping sorry, with no, Wayne no, no. Bridge's I read, wife. I read out that. Let's that, be fair to him. That now. was um, that was confusing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> I wasn't saying that. Uh, <laughs> but insisting that Solskjaer should remain at the helm is like saying John Terry should have been sacked as England captain for sleeping with Wayne Bridge's ex. Uh, one of those arguments which looks beyond silly down the line. I I just think. Now, like, as I said, you, that's what a column does. It gets you kind of wound up. Uh, so he does that very well. Yeah. Is it not just... No, just because... Uh, and he makes the point that because uh, is such a nice guy, baby-faced, all that stuff, that he's not getting the proper um, criticism, you know, criticism almost, that he yeah. deserves. But I just think, I mean, are they not producing Greenwood and Young... You know, have they not the Young fellas coming through that, like... Don't... He doesn't deserve a kicking like this this soon. Dracula and Lance Armstrong, <laughs> I, w I would suggest. Yeah. Um, I mean, they the won again yesterday, but like, surely he deserves at least an, to get to another season, no? He, by the way, because again, I just think in Ainman's defence, and there'll be listeners going, Lance Armstrong, what's happened here? Oh, yeah. He's um, just making the point that it's a bit like the beginning of the end game in the Lance Armstrong yeah, sorry, saga. Sorry, he's not implying he's where, a drugs cheater. And no, he's not. He's basically saying there's a sense that the end is nigh here, that this is not going to work out, and it's just a case of how long we suspend the inevitable. And yeah, so, yeah, hence yeah. the arms trying to do his job very well, Eamon. Like, you're kind of like <laughs> gripped by it, but I, I just think it's a bit over the top. You found your, your, your fist clenching as you read it, did you? <laughs> yeah. In defense of Olga Solskjaer. Are you a United I'm, fan? No, and I really like, but I really like Solskjaer. I just really like, I liked him as a player and I like watching him now. Mm -hmm. I like the way, I like his accent, you know, that, that kind of <laughs> Carnation, Carnation Street thing he has going on, Scandinavian's yeah. edge to it. But like, R Robbie Fowler makes a point in his column in the Sunday Mirror today, and, and it makes sense that he would discuss it because he, <coughs> he would actually be able to relate to it a little bit. Yeah. It's like he's sort of coming in at the point whereby obviously Fowler was part of a Liverpool team in the early 90s that was very talented and was still being compared to Liverpool teams of the past when they had just been successful. And Solskjaer is, is trying to Solskjaer's doing that himself, you know. He's trying to create that link with with supporters and the history of the club, and like, he's a he's a united man and stuff. And that it does only it does only get you so far, but because it, it's a, it's very similar to what Klopp done, and when he came in, like, Klopp was derided when he was bringing the Liverpool team up in front of the cop after drawing two two away with West Brom and mm. and celebrating it. But his message was clear. It was kind of like he was trying to get that connection with with supporters and. I don't think Solskjaer's, it's clear, Solskjaer's not, it doesn't seem to be on the level of a, of a Klopp in terms of maybe as a coach or, or a manager, but there can be sometimes a lot to be said at the moment with United in terms of having that connection with, with, with supporters and bringing those players through. And it's interesting here, yesterday United went 3 up and the fans weren't singing about against the manager, they were singing out against Woodward and, and the Glazers. Yeah. And it'd be, I think there'd be a big sense with Solskjaer would be like he was very critical of Mourinho indirectly where he just said the players weren't fit enough. Mm. And that's that's what he put last year. Where, remember, he had that great start, won like 16 out of 17 games, whatever. And then he just fell apart after, mm. pretty much after PSG away. So it'll be a big it'll be a big thing this year. I think there'll be a question mark going into next season, if he is still there, is how he finish this season. Yeah. Like you look at what happened during the week against CE and it was the first half was just atrocious and then CE just took the foot off the gas. Um, if they finish the season strongly under Solskjaer, and actually, I don't know if they will get Champions League under four or five points off Chelsea. But if they finish the season strongly and, and do grind out wins, that would be a sign of progress. You know, what like whether they win a cup or whatever, but it's it's gonna be the end of this season. So what Eamon Sweeney is saying is correct in saying in terms of is there a sense of the end in end is now. If if United you know, don't finish the season strongly, well then that'll be a big that'll be a big black mark against Solskjaer because he came in on the basis of well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have these players fit. Mm. I'm going to have these players firing and stuff, so they've been inconsistent, and part of that has been down to the fact that, like, it's, like again, it goes above them as well. Like they, they knew they were going to be losing under Herrera. They de never even replaced him. They mm. knew they were going to be wanting to get rid of Matic, but he's still he's still around. Fellaini was gone. Like he, he has been ruthless though. Like he's gotten he's he's gotten rid of Chris Small and like he's put him out on loan. He's getting criticised yeah. for that. Like he has Brandon Williams in there now. At, and now at left back, it's just the problem is, is that Liverpool are so far ahead 
of United in, in every aspect. And we're talking about United here as if they're plucky underdogs and not one of the world's the richest teams. They've got the highest wage bill in European Problem. football. You know what I mean? They've wasted so much. Money. It definitely seems the club are of a mind to be loyal now, that they've chopped and changed manager and they've spent about a billion yeah. pounds doing so, and it's almost like they've said, right, we need to at least stick with someone. We can't just have Van Gaal buying a bunch of players, then Mourinho buying a bunch of different players, and we end up with a mishmash. <laughs> yeah. But they've stumbled upon Solskjaer, they gave him the job, and around that time, they said, right, we really need to be loyal to this guy now. And Miguel Delaney was on with us during the week, and he said even after the City game, the sense in the club was, we're sticking by this guy. Yeah. The problem is they're sticking by an unknown quantity. Like, at least when Liverpool stuck by Klopp at the start, well, one, there were signs of definite progress, but two, what he had done at Dortmund was evidence and, yeah, and yeah, supported yeah. the notion that this guy is worth sticking by. Yeah, yeah. So even he if had a body of work that you could believe work. in. So yeah, if this yeah. gets patchy... Let's just trust this guy that if we give him enough time, which no club does, mm. the body of work at Dortmund and his general vibe suggests he will get this thing right eventually. Whereas United now are in this strange position where the one guy they've decided to be loyal to through even the thin parts, as well as the uh, thick parts, th through thick and thin, is a guy that they can't be sure of. That there's no body of evidence there so to suggest that So would you agree with right Eamon thing. towards the end of his piece where he says it's time to put Solskjaer out of his misery, he doesn't represent the club's tradition or its values? I feel like it's incredibly harsh to do that because Solskjaer has certainly not proven himself to be a bad manager yet. Mm. The thing that makes me think maybe they need to be ruthless is that Pochettino ain't hanging around forever and he is in that yeah, elite, is, yeah. elite, elite category that you know if Pochettino come in within a year United would be back finishing second or third very quickly and then pushing on. Yeah. But I do think sacking Salzgar at this moment in time will be massively unpopular with fans it around would, the yeah. club. Like, I don't think it will go down well at all. So well, it would, it's, it, it's a genuine dilemma. Unless, they got, unless the, the, only, the only feasible way at the moment that they could justify sacking Solskjaer is if the next day they announce Pochettino. Like Correct. You can't, you can't just sack him and then not have a plan. Sorry, it has to be for Pochettino. Yeah, well, give so, or take. Yeah, effectively. Like, they missed out on Klopp and they missed out on Guardiola. And that's yeah, and, they, and Ferguson went for both of them. Ferguson like mm. did speak to both of them people, but like. But, but I do feel it would still be very harsh. Mm. But I think Solskjaer would be saying, "Well, are you giving me a chance here or not?" Yeah. I wonder is Eamon a United fan? Is he? Like it's Sligo Rovers, I know. Rovers, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's a good column. Like if, in if, if you look on, on you like, know, we can talk about this all day. But with, with Solskjaer, like he's had to deal with the, the Pogba situation, where Pogba is effectively devil tills. Yes, difficult. Yeah. Right? And there's elements there around the dressing room where, if you, when you read, because so many, you, there's so many good lads covering the United beat. There's. There's not much getting out about him not being popular with, with players or him not like you know what I mean. So yeah. it, it's just gonna be he has to deliver on the pitch. It's like it's it's basic, it's as simple as that, but he needs back like Woodward, he's in a he's actually in a slightly strong position in the sense that Wood, Woodward is being in terms of on the pitch a disaster. So like he he was the one who oversaw Moyes coming in, mm. got rid of Moyes, mm. brought in Van Gaal, got rid of Van Gaal literally within a day of winning the FA Cup, he gets Mourinho, sacks Mourinho. And now you look at the Woodward stuff as well about he's the highest paid CEO, but they're still falling behind now off the pitch. Like Wood and there's there's another lad there who is it's not just Woodward now, there's another lad there, George, I think his name is I can't remember his first name. Um who who he's heavily involved with. So again, it just comes back to just, there's a lot of problems around Solskjaer. Well, I don't think Solskjaer by any means is is the biggest problem, but so far I, I still don't think at the moment that you can't hang your hat on him to say, yeah, this is the fellow who's definitely going to turn it around because there's just so too many issues around the club that are going to hold him back at a time when City are on a completely different level and at the moment Liverpool are even a level above that. And things can change quickly in football, but you don't see a change in any time soon where, but with the standards whereby that Liverpool have set. And mm. that's probably one of the worst things for United at the moment is that it's their biggest rivals who are setting these standards and look as if they could be ready to dominate with, with City for the next four, four years. 4 isn't a bad place to be coming off. And like, yeah, but against the, bo to those kids. the bottom team in the league. Like. Ah. <laughs> yeah, by the way, Adam Eda was starting with front four, which he was. Yeah, yeah. Which was that's, that's actually something, to, I know we're, we're done yeah, time-wise, yeah. but uh, it's good to see some positive on the Irish soccer. Thing. No, it is. There seems to be a really good generation. Kids, but like the, the FAI, you know, the, the, it looks the independent like directors. It's just a, a sense from the yeah. papers today of turning a corner, like Philip Quinn in the Mail and elsewhere. Like, it's mm. just... It's nice to read. Yeah, about long overdue. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, fellas. David Snaid, football journalist, and Hugh Farley, the deputy head of sport at the Mail on Sunday and the Irish Daily Mail. Thanks so much. We're back next week. <laughs>